Welcome to the latest episode of MQ's Open Mind podcast. And we're delighted, Craig and I are delighted that our guest today is Louise Arsenault. And Louise is Professor of Developmental Psychology at King's College in London. So welcome to our podcast, Louise. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No, no we're delighted to have you here. Obviously, I know you in sort of slightly different fora. Um, but what we're really focused in on today is, well, so sort of get, trying to get to know you a bit better in the context for our listeners about your sort of journey in mental health research, but but also really focusing in on this really important report, which published, was it a couple of weeks ago now, was it, the report was published? Yeah, last week, actually. La- oh, it was only last week, last week. I'm, 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 <laughs> and time travel problems I'm clearly having. <laughs> um, I'm going to on annual leave after this today, so that... <laughs> Oh. <laughs> it's not a bad idea. But no, the really important sort of landscaping document you've done yeah. in terms of uh, the worldwide sort of resource now for long, longitudinal data sets. So we'll, we'll come back to that. So maybe then if we can go back to where, um, well, the beginning, which is, so can you tell us a bit about, I know you're a Canadian um, and uh, studied in Montreal, but it'd be great to maybe just tell us a bit about your journey in, in mental health research. What brought you into the area? What interests you? And sort of how you got to uh, coming to King's um, a few years yeah. ago, uh, yeah. some years ago. Wow. OK, um, that is a an interesting question. So, yes, I I am from Montreal, so I'm French Canadian. Um, you can see hear that in my strange accent. Um, but I I studied in psychoeducation. So originally I'm trained, you know, to work with people with um, mental health conditions. Um, And that was my undergraduate kind of degree. And as I kind of started working, I realized early on that I felt I didn't have that much to offer, you know, to the profession in some ways. And I rather kind of um, continue to study so maybe that would be my my better way of helping, you know, people who suffer from mental health conditions. So um, I decided to do a PhD in biomedical sciences, which is some kind of a, a strange umbrella. In the end, I, uh, as part of that PhD, I really learn how to conduct research, do research, and. Um, actually, I started my I started doing research by collecting data as part of a longitudinal data set. That was my entry into the world of research and mental health um, uh, mental health research. And then I got you know kind of postdoc funding, which kind of brought me to move to the UK. And actually, that was 25 years ago last week. So I've celebrated my 25th anniversary. Last week, isn't that amazing? Congratulations, congratulations. Thank you. Um, Very pleased about that, actually. So that is what brought me into mental health. I think I always wanted to engage in a um, support relationship. And I thought that dealing with physical health was too concrete. Mm -hmm. It was kind of, I didn't want to work with um, arms or skin or, you know, I wanted to work with something which was more abstract. I'm just curious how you've just, you pointed out you didn't want to work with arms or skin. No other parts of the anatomy? No. (laughs) Brain. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I was thinking about which part can I say without being (laughs) too controversial. (laughs) So I thought that the, um, the mind was kind of something more abstract that was a big challenge. And so, yeah, that was where the the interest in mental health, I think somehow something which was more abstract, but, you know, um, still related to this support relationship, you know, to help people overcome, you know, kind of challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what, that is what brought me into it. And then, you know, I think that realize quickly on my lack of knowledge and wanted to understand better so just a quick question just on the <clears throat> the longitudinal data set stuff yeah so when you were in montreal had, so did you establish we part of a group establishing a longitudinal yeah. data set yeah right. so that is even after so after my after my degree, um, I was kind of looking for a summer job and someone who is working in our research group back in Montreal, they asked me, they said, would you mind kind of coordinating this kind of lab that we're setting up for the summer, which was part of a longitudinal study? And I said, yeah, fine. OK, yeah, we'll do it. 
I didn't have that much experience, but I kind of led a team. I think that we were six research workers and we, we had five kids with conduct problems coming every day of the summer and we had a whole series of tests during the day so i i did that for a whole summer and at the end of the summer the person who became my phd advisor said to me you know we want to keep you but as a phd student so suddenly it was, I was, a, trombe, it was a tremblay, tremblay. Yeah, yeah yeah richard tremblay um back in montreal so that is where everything started basically. And I remember very precisely the meeting that we had where he asked me, he said, well, I would want you to continue and do a PhD. And I was so surprised by this. I was kind of going, I don't have any talent. You know, yeah, why yeah. do you ask me? I said, the only merit that I have is to work really hard when I want something. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, that's good enough for me. <laughs> oh, that's obviously that sort of imposter syndrome that we all experience, yeah. but... Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but that's a brilliant opportunity then. Absolutely. But I really felt that I started uh, doing research by collecting data. Mm -hmm. And 25 years later, I am still involved in research where data collection is at the core. Yeah, the core. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that is defining really my career. You know, the importance of data collection in doing research. Well, also really good good quality data collection, I think, is at the heart of it. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is the foundation for everything. And quite often, which is a shame, is that researchers see that as uh, just a step. You know, we, we just need to collect data. They don't spend that much time recruiting the right people to collect the data. They don't think yeah. very much about what do we need to collect. And that's such a shame because this is the foundation for everything, everything mm -hmm. in research. Um, so I am a true believer that data collections are really, really important and that we are not making the most out of the data that is collected. So then, so then do you wonder, and thinking about the training that we do in the UK or, or elsewhere, I mean, I wonder then, do you think that we don't prioritize the importance of good data collection and that it's more seen as a means to an end rather than <laughs> being a fundamental skill and endeavor in itself? I think that maybe the training should be, well, wait, that's an important question. I think that we do not necessarily want to fund just anybody to collect data because I think it does require skills and thinking and preparation. So funding kind of quick data collection for me is not such a good investment, but there are people who do that beautifully, that are very experienced, that have a whole infrastructure behind them. So I think that we absolutely need to kind of support those infrastructure and researchers. I think that it is important for people to appreciate the value of of good quality data, but I think also very importantly, it is important that training focus on how to use those data. Yeah. So I think that we need to kind of support young people in acquiring skills to be able to, you know, use the data, analyze the data. And I'm not sure whether everybody needs to collect data because we have so much data already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll come back to the, the data issue shortly when we focus in on the landscaping report so just then just to go back to the in terms of your sort of history your career so in that early work yeah. i think you mentioned you were in montreal still you were you were it was a um assessing adhd so your interest in mental health was a par and then and yeah. then you've just continued with that yeah absolutely so i s studied kind of more conduct problems when I was um, doing my my PhD. And I did work on, yeah, trying to understand the early origins of aggressive behavior. And I, I thought that, yeah, I had a connection with people who are more aggressive. So that was something kind of really interesting to, to for me. But then when I moved to London, then I kind of joined a different longitudinal kind of data, you know, kind of group doing longitudinal data. And I joined a very well established group based in New Zealand. But then I also joined um, a group that was establishing a new longitudinal data set. So, so it was very interesting for me to be able to capitalize on a very well established, mm -hmm. you know, group, but also kind of being part of starting a new kind of longitudinal data. 
So, so the established one was the Dunedin. Yeah. The Dunedin. Uh, yeah. And yeah. So then, you, so you were involved now from London. Yeah, absolutely. I went to Dunedin to spend more uh, a bit of time to work with the team and to understand the context, which I think is really, really important, and met kind of policymakers. And, you know, I was kind of meeting them, sharing the results that I had. So that was very important with me, but to me. But yeah, I was based in, in London. And then we were starting the ERIS, the Environmental Risk Longitudinal Twin Study in the UK. So I was working with uh, Professor Moffat and Caspi. And we kind of um, set it up. So I was involved in data collection, you know, as part of that beautiful cohort study as well. So, um, yeah, yeah. so what this is maybe a bit of an unfair question, uh, I'm flagging that now. But what do you think has been like the one or two most important findings that you've been involved in um, publishing related to any of those data sets? Oh my God. I said, I said it was unfair. Is that, I mean, the, I mean, the most impactful, maybe. Uh, okay. Well, I think that um, working with the Dunedin study was absolutely amazing because it's such a well-established uh, longitudinal study, which um, had so much to offer somehow. And that really kind of kicked me towards more uh, mental health condition rather than aggressive behaviors. So that was really important for me. But then I started working with the e-risk study, and then mm -hmm. I developed a program of research on bullying victimization. Yeah. And for me, that was really important because while I was not necessarily interested by a specific condition, I was very much interested by risk factors and testing those risk factors and to what extent do they really contribute to the development of mental health problems. And working with a twin study was very key because it allowed us to control for genetic confounders, which I couldn't find in any other cohort study before. So for me, that was really key. And I could develop really a whole program of research looking at how bullying victimization can influence mental health, but also physical health. Um, so that was really a data set that offered me um, a platform to develop research on this. But then at some point I moved on and I worked with another longitudinal data set and that would be the National Child Development Study. So the 1958 cohort, which allowed us to examine whether being bullied in childhood could have long-term impact. And to me, that was absolutely key in the development of my career for different ways, but it was one of the most impactful paper that we've published, you know, looking at the long-term outcome of being bullied. And yeah. I like that paper for various reasons, but one of them, it was published in one of the most impactful journals. So the American, uh, yeah, the American Journal of Psychiatry, mm -hmm. um, and it made the cover. So for me, it was really important that suddenly bullying, which was dismissed, you know, yeah. for many years as, oh, it's part of life, it's not important. Suddenly, it was the cover of the M American Journal of Psychiatry. And we did, you know, it was throughout the whole kind of newspapers and the media outlets when it was published. So did the Today program and, you know, um, lots of different interviews. But the most important thing was that I, th I thought that in terms of impact, that paper kind of published, um, ticked all the boxes because the journal was happy because we were on the media. My dean was happy because, um, <laughs> you know, we were in one of the top journal. Um, so I was kind of going, oh, that's great. And after kind of um, coming back from the BBC, I went back to my office, opened my computer, turned on my computer, and then I, um, I look at my emails, and then suddenly I kind of realized that I had lots of emails from people from the public mm -hmm. kind of saying to me, hey, I heard you this morning in the news, and what you describe is my life. Yeah. And to me, that was impact. So, And it's a shame because in some ways, this is not recorded anywhere in, you know, the importance of research and what we do. But for me, that was the first time I was doing research involving adults, because before I always worked with children and teenagers, but adults, they can kind of reach out to you and they can tell you what they think. And suddenly I had this opportunity and so many people kind of engage with me, kind of saying, this is really important. This is how I feel. Or they would say, I'm doing okay, but I will never forget that I was bullied when I was a, when I was a kid. And to me, that was one of the most important 
paper because it made me realize what we can do with research. Yeah, well, absolutely. I think that is really, really powerful. And <clears throat> how our, our research can affect people's lives and hopefully for the better. But I think in, I suppose with the ref, the ref, we are getting better at trying to recognize that impact, of course. But so what, what was it? So in terms of just for the, the paper, so what was the key finding of the paper? Yeah, so we kind of showed using the 1958 cohort that those study participants who were bullied between the ages of 7 and 11, so in childhood, we could see that they were struggling compared to other participants yeah. who hadn't been bullied. So they had more symptoms of mental health problems. They had more physical health problems. They had worse socioeconomic outcomes. They have been doing less well in terms of employment. Uh, and they also had trouble in establishing relationships. So it was the first time as part of a big cohort, you know, which allow us um, to study people across so many years that we could show that actually being bullied in childhood, you know, had a long-term impact on people's life. So, um, and of course we did control for many, many confounding factors. We couldn't control for genetic confound, unfortunately, but I, we don't expect um, a study to cover everything, uh -huh. you know, yeah. but that, that study kind of allow us to look at people, you know, throughout several decades of their life. So. That was very important. So, in terms of um, interventions, then, so what what should we do, we be doing better? Yeah. Uh, to support, or how should we be supporting people who are bullied? And I assume it also mm. the bully is also at yeah. increased risk as well of per mental health. Absolutely. Mm. Um. So, in some ways, what our research kind of shows is definitely that we should support any intervention in the schools that aims to stop bullying behavior. So that is the the bullying behavior is at the core, isn't it, of the whole kind of dynamic or cycle of violence. So we should support anti-bullying programs in schools. The schools have a responsibility of making their institution a safe place for all the kids. Mm -hmm. So that is really important that we do that. But we need to do more. You're absolutely right. And we need to focus a little bit more on the victims. Mm -hmm. So we need to kind of make sure that they are supported when they experience bullying victimization. And we don't need to call the psychiatrist straight away, but we need to be able to provide some kind of a network of support for those kids who experience something traumatic sometimes yeah. or very unpleasant most of the time. So we need to provide more support of it for the victims and something which I think is still controversial. We could build more resilience, you know, for young kids. And it's not to say that they are to blame for this, what happens, absolutely not. But we could provide, you know, kind of further skills to make sure that they're better equipped to face that. And we can draw from family resources to be able to do that. So that is really important. And of course, so that is kind of more targeted intervention but we should kind of also have more universal interventions when we equip all the kids you know with social skills being yeah. able to kind of interact with people being able to make friends being a friend maintaining relationships and friendship is really important yeah yeah no, no, really well said and really really important work but I suppose selfishly with the, obviously my interest in suicide yeah again the in our work, we've also demonstrated, <clears throat> excuse me, the obviously that really powerful relationship with bullying and suicide risk. And I know recently you have a couple of papers, I think, in press, Louise, um, looking at the 50-year co uh, cohort study findings looking at bullying and suicide risk. Do you want to say a bit about that? Oh, Marie-Claude Geoffroy, yes, yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. So I think that what Marie-Claude kind of did was to look at suicide, but but it was kind of mortality you know, it, it was, yeah. um, and I think that we could, we, we managed to be able to kind of look into this because the National Child Development Study, again, um, had good measures of uh, mortality. And we could establish the link between being bullied and mortality by suicide, which was important, of course, because we think that, you know, kind of suicide self-harm is really the end of the continuum yeah, yeah. when you think about the yeah, just you a know, devastating a harmful, end, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And while I think that quite often that makes the news, I think that we need to understand that yeah. link 
better. Um, so Marie Claude was capable of establishing that link, but of course, you know, mortality is something difficult to. Well, the number of cases of um, death by suicide were not that common, thank God yeah, for that. Yeah. But mm -hmm. you know, it's difficult to establish that link. But Marie Claude was capable of of doing that as part of NCDS. And it's beautiful because we have data on bullying victimization in childhood, but also mortality because, you know, the study kind of followed these participants for such a long time. Okay, no, I'll look forward to that, those papers coming out. So maybe just a couple of other things before we move on to the, um, the landscaping report. So obviously we touched on some of your work on, on bullying, but you've also done work on sort of genetic sensitivity. Yeah. Loneliness. Do you want to tell us a bit about those? Yeah. Well, I think at some point I felt that maybe the, the research I was doing on bullying victimization was narrowed a bit and I wanted to expand to other aspects. And I felt that social relationship was a common thread, you know, in all the research I was doing and kind of decided to expand to other forms of poor social relationship. And then loneliness kind of became a an important topic. And I work with one of my colleagues, Timothy Matthews, um, in establishing this kind of um, program of research about loneliness in young people. So quite often we study loneliness in elderly people, but it is also important to kind of uh, mention that actually loneliness is most prevalent in young people. And that was a bit controversial because people didn't think about that. And I think that maybe that is one thing which is a common thread in in the research that I do is that it's always kind of pushing the boundaries of people's kind of understanding, you know, yeah. kind of when I started doing research on bullying victimization, no one kind of thought it was really harmful. And loneliness, no one thought that, you know, loneliness is something important in young people. So lots of young people kind of suffering from feeling lonely. And this is probably a marker. So it's associated with a range of poor outcome, mental health difficulties. And I think that this is an important marker for poor functioning in, yeah. in young people in young people. So if someone complains of loneliness, I think it's it's an entry again into someone's life, you know, which is not going so well. So we should absolutely not dismiss that. We should use this kind of door to kind of inquire a little bit more about functioning and mental health yeah, problems yeah. of young people. And I think that loneliness issue has become became especially a part oh. during the pandemic as well. Obviously yeah. some research have increased Loneliness, despite all this, obviously, narrative around, but they've access to social media and so on. Absolutely. That the complexity. But do you want to say anything about the genetic sensitivity work you've been doing? Well, yeah, I, um, I think that I work at the SGDP Centre, so the Social Genetic and Developmental Psychiatry Centre. And while I am not the person at the department mm -hmm. which will be looking for the genes or the impact of the genes, um, I'm much more into more environmental risk factor. I do appreciate, you know, the importance of genetic factors. So whenever I can, I really try to control for the confounding effect of genetic um, factors, or I try to test whether it is a marker of increased risk for having mm -hmm. mental health problems. So you can imagine that, you know, lots of kids are being bullied. Not all of them will develop mental health problems. So um, some research that we did kind of looked into, is it possible that some people are more genetically predisposed to having mental health problems if they get bullied? So yeah. I think in some ways, for me, genetic sensitivity or genetic factors are important because they help me draw a more kind of specific picture about the importance of mm -hmm. the environment. So yes, so I, I do value that. And I am totally against this idea that we have dichotomy and yeah. people are social, people are environmental. No, I, I and I, we still, I still feel a lot of that. Um, yeah. And I, I think that this is not conducive to good research we need to kind of use both and i wish that some geneticists would see that with environmental yeah. factors mm -hmm. you know 
but I think that we are a long way away from this. I think that geneticists or some people do we no, yeah, let me reframe this. Be careful. People do, yes. <laughs> people I won't be able to enter that building anymore. <laughs> some people doing genetic research, I think, um, do not embrace the challenges of working with more environmental measures, but it is very important. Yeah, no, because of course, I mean, it stands to reason that if we're to properly understand an individual in their context, yeah. like you can't understand an individual without their context. And similarly, you can't understand a context without understanding the individual, which includes absolutely vulnerability factors. But again, it's still it's so important that we continue to better beat that drum and really loudly. Yeah. Um, OK, so Louise, just moving on then, since time is marching on, I've just seen here as we've been chatting. Um, is So tell us a bit about it. I know you've recently, well, I don't know when you've precisely finished the role, but you were the mm -hmm. Mental Health Leadership Fellow for the ESRC. Yep. Can you tell us a bit about what that role involved and what yeah. you what you think it, or hope it achieved? Yeah, so I became the leadership fellow for the Economic and Social Research Council in 2016. And that was something a bit new, I think. Well, definitely new for me, but also I think for the research council to have someone which, who is appointed as a champion for a, a topic or something. So, so I think that there was a huge or there was a true desire from the ESRC to embed mental health in their portfolio of, of research, whether it was a priority or whether it was kind of spread across any kind of initiative so that it would become a cross-cutting themes in some ways. So that was that was a bit of a challenging um, role for me because I think that the scope was quite wide. Uh, expectations were quite high. Um, but, you know, I'm only one individual. I'm not an institution, you know, or I'm not a big team, you know, it's just me, basically. So I, I it was very daunting at first um, to try to understand the landscape of mental health research in the UK and what were the challenges. But yes, so it was very challenging, but it gave me the opportunity to maybe leave my office a bit more, um, meet people and understand what were the priorities for a wide range of different people. So that was an important role for me, at least in my career trajectory, it was definitely an important role. And it is somehow a shame that when I started, mental health was a priority for the ESRC, but they had to change. Um, and midway through, it was not anymore. Um, so so why, why did that happen? Well, I think that um, there was, um, you know, quite often you have those kind of um, vision or priority yeah. reports and stuff like this. So at some point, you know, mental health was part. And, and I think that I was ap appointed as part of that, you know, as a, a priority for the ESRC to develop their mental health portfolio. But I can absolutely appreciate that not all the research councils can focus on the same priority. So there needs to be some kind of um, a divide in some ways. And suddenly, instead of making um, mental health as a priority for the ESRC, my aim was to ensure that mental health was represented throughout all the priority areas at the ESRC. Okay. So that kind of shift, you know, in some ways, I think that that was a disappointing news, but try to kind of just shift the focus somehow so yeah. that mental health remain on top, you know, yeah. of the priority list. And this is something which I think that we need to do to make sure that mental health remains or climb on top of people's list yeah. you know funders researchers institution all of that yeah because it sort of reflects i mean i'm speaking as a somebody who lives in scotland but looking to what's happened in westminster recently where yeah. in the last few months is i think i see that well my view is that mental health has been deprioritized in westminster when obviously they abandoned the publication of the 10-year mental health strategy replaced it with obviously just a focus on mental health as a major condition. Yeah. But that is a deprioritization without a doubt. So I wonder, there's so broadly, there is an issue, I think, that we still need to tackle it. Although, yes, when you think back to 25 years ago when you arrived in the UK, yeah. and compare to the prioritization of mental health then versus now, definitely there's been progress. Yeah. But not as not, there's no way is there anything to do with equal footing Thank or leveling you. up on that in that sense so so that's sad to sort of hear that but um but it just means we just have to continue to fight absolutely yeah 
Yeah. Absolutely. And you're absolutely right to say that um, we've come a long way in some ways, you know, in terms yeah. of mental health. And when it, you talk about um, stigma, awareness, absolutely. But funding, not yet. We're not yeah. there yet. And yeah. that has a huge impact. So we well, need to. Yeah. On that note, then, on that note, let's move on to okay. um, well, a, a really important output, um, yeah. which hopefully will help help all of us in the field. So I think it's so so maybe be really helpful to tell us how this came about. But this is a welcome funded um, project. I think it's called Landscaping International Longitudinal Datasets. Yes. So over to you, Louise. So what what was the background? What's it hoping to achieve? Yes. Um, well, can I, maybe a the good place to start with just to kind of relate it to the ESRC fellowship, yeah. uh, mental health fellowship. As part of that, what we um, I established was a platform to make mental health measures already collected by longitudinal study much more discoverable for researchers. So I established that as part of the ESRC fellowship saying, you know, we need to kind of increase capacity in research. We There's been massive investment in longitudinal research and we have mental health data, but they are not used to the maximum. So I will create this platform where it's easier for people to find out about those mental health measures. So I created that. Um, I think we launched it in 2019 and it was really fun. And it started as a small project. And now it's quite a, it is a platform which is quite well established. And I think that lots of people are using it. So it's beautiful. Uh, it's beautiful for it's a beautiful platform, but it's also beautiful for me <laughs> in terms of... I like all the beauty. All the beauty is good. Absolutely. And if you go in the platform, you will see that there's a theme and you will see that it is related to the theme in my office <laughs> behind me. <laughs> but I think that related... So hold on. For those who are, who are listening to this and not viewing this, so the way in the background in our office, it's like, a, yeah. I mean, an incredible um, greenhouse. forest of... <laughs> It's like a, a rainforest of beauty. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> I'm lucky my office is well lit, so that I'm, I'm yeah. lucky with that. But I think that we developed some kind of um, a very kind of specific skills about identifying longitudinal studies in the UK with a focus of making mental health data much more visible and discoverable. And then suddenly at some point, Welcome um, made a call about landscaping. So I think that, yeah, landscaping. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> landscaping is everywhere, it seems. I know. So, so they made a call about landscaping the world for longitudinal data sets. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, you know, that has our name on it. We need to kind of apply for that. And, you know, we are so chuffed and so grateful that Welcome picked us you know, to kind of carry, conduct this piece of work, which is huge. It is a huge piece of work, which has three aims. So Welcome kind of commissioned us to do three things. And one of them would be to review the richness of all the longitudinal data sets in the world to be able to identify pockets of value. What are the things that are really good in those data sets that we should capitalize on and that we should maximize? The other thing was to analyze areas of enrichment. How can we make those data sets even better? Where do we need to invest in helping and supporting those data sets to make them even better? But you can imagine that to be able to do that, we need, and that was the third aim, we need to identify all the longitudinal data yeah. sets in the world. And that's where we start, of course. And I think that the welcome didn't really expect that there are so many resources in the world. So we've identified more than 3,000 longitudinal data sets in the world. And I work with a fantastic team of um, people who were absolutely determined to kind of find all of those data sets. So we engage with lots of different people, different organization. And, you know, we identified 8,000 data sets, but 3,000 were longitudinal. So um, we work and it's with... Across, it's across 146 countries as well. Yeah, absolutely. So it was very important that we scan the whole world. So it was not only in low... Uh, no, it was not just in high-income countries that have 
more resources to establish those data sets, but it had to be across the world. So we had a very specific focus in making sure that we kind of really scan through countries, you know, in Africa or in South America or in Asia. But um, when you look at the proportion of studies that we've identified, 25% are coming from the Middle East, Africa and Asia. So I think mm. that we did a good job at identifying those. And we've been working with a group of people who helped us identifying them. So that was a huge part of the work that we did. At some point, Welcome kind of said, OK, you need to stop. You need to stop kind of looking for data sets because you need to analyze <laughs> them. And we're saying, oh, yeah, don't worry, don't worry, we will. Um, hold on. So just to clarify, are these all, they're all not necessarily mental health data sets, but no. mental health variables in them? That's right. But even some studies don't have mental health data sets, but in the view of enriching those data sets, we could say that data sets is absolutely amazing. It doesn't have mental health measures. So we would propose, okay, we need to enrich that data uh, okay, set. Yeah. So it was any kind of, um, well, it was a cross sector. So it didn't have to be only from academia, but it had to. It could be from third sector, from the industry as well, and it didn't have to have mental health measures to start with. So we have lots of data sets that we identify that are focused on either social factor or on physical health. Great. Okay. But then for those studies, I think that quite a few of them kind of dropped along the way when we kind of um, we had to make a selection at some point to identify a few that could be enriched. Mm -hmm. So some of them kind of dropped, of course, along the way. We started very wide, but we needed to kind of end up with a narrow selection. But yes, I, and of, of course, the final ones would be kind of um, have mental health measures, of course. And then we had to analyze, okay, how can they be improved and enriched? And am I right in thinking, so most of the, or most of the, or the common features were, where the mental health was included, it was looking at Primarily what depression, anxiety, psychosis, is that right? That is the aim of the, the call. What Welcome kind of asked us was very, very much centered around depression, anxiety and psychosis and how existing longitudinal studies could speed up, you know, kind of research in tackling those um, those conditions. But of course, you know, we did find great studies focus on other things as well yeah. and we we have included them so lots of studies on bipolar disorder for example mm -hmm. ptsd lots and lots of very good kind of data sets on those disorders as well so we didn't ignore them um, and quite often those those data sets also have measures of anxiety and depression yeah. and psychosis so um, you rarely find a study that is focused on one condition yes, you know course, quite yeah. often there's more so so yeah so we discovered lots and lots of data sets few of them that are um big data sets you know with um ongoing with participants at an age when we feel okay yeah we could enrich those data sets because your capacity of finding more about the development of those conditions. And then when you select those, then there are very few of those big initiatives that are focused on mental health. Yeah. So quite a lot, they are focused on physical health or socioeconomic kind of development, you know, but quite a few of them are from low and middle income countries. So we were quite pleased about this. We yeah. didn't have to kind of drag or scrape, you know, they're mm -hmm. there. There's lots of good research or data sets, you know, um, but very few of those big kind of resources focused on mental health. Yeah. Quite often it feels an afterthought. Oh, we yeah. will include a measure of depression or, oh, at some point, but no kind of good planning of those yeah so on so when you talk about enrichment yeah. uh, is it that in the report that what you're trying to do is say here are data sets which are potentially enrichable yeah. there's not it's not that welcome or providing funding to to enrich the data sets are they well i think that it is with a vision of you know kind of making a step change okay. and so it's kind of a discussion with the welcome about how can we enrich those very promising data sets yeah okay well, that's encouraging. So what, what's the space then, I suppose? Yes. Um, in terms of the process, am I right in understanding? So lived experience were involved 
yes. heavily and centrally in the process. Absolutely. So we are we've been so lucky to be able to work with MQ, who kind of took on the challenge of making sure that the live experience expert were part of this project throughout. And it's really interesting because um you know, the, the aim of the project was really to identify those data sets. So I was kind of going, well, how can live experience be involved in this? You know, I mean, we need to identify, we need to search. I mean, you know, what can we do? But it was really interesting that MQ kind of really changed my vision about, about live experience involvement in the project. So they kind of set up a theory of change kind of process involving people with live experience and also people from different background. And we kind of discussed the value of longitudinal data sets, how they could pot potentially be enriched and um, what would be pockets of value? Where is the richness of those uh, data sets? So we really kind of took on board this information as part of our process of identifying, analyzing and reviewing. But then at the end, it was like, Okay, that's that's great. That's fantastic. And one thing which we I can mention as part of the topic of live experience experts is very few longitudinal data sets work with live experience experts. Okay. So this is one part of the enrichment that was very clear in our report that we need to kind of really promote engagement with either service users community or people with live yeah. experience to make Maybe. sure yeah absolutely and then at the towards the end of the process the discussion became more about how can we make that happen you know how how can we really kind of um have a true engagement with live experienced experts when it comes to longitudinal data sets so i've learned so much you know i've been conducting or involved in longitudinal research for a long long time and you know, like many other researchers, not necessarily kind of engage with live experienced experts when it comes to longitudinal data sets. And then suddenly, you know, I kind of became aware of, of course, you know, of course, you know, you know, we, we could do this and we should do this, yeah. you know, that way. So it was extremely um, enriching for me, you know, not only the data sets, but I became enriched as well <laughs> as part of this project <laughs> and 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 really kind of discover about how we can make that happen and it's really it's not me writing this you know it doesn't yes. come from me it comes from mq led process engaging with live experience and they told us this is how fantastic and so we're coming down to almost the end of our time um, louise so if we want to know more about the report how can we find yes. it our, we have two outcomes, basically, from this project. One of them is a website where you can find the lists of all the longitudinal data sets that we've identified. So it's there. People can see them. They cannot really search it very well, but you know, all the lists, the lists with all the data sets are there. And then we have, as part of our website, we have the report, which is there. Um, and there we kind of explore or we share with people the richness, but also the areas of enrichment. And of course, we have a beautiful report from MQ about live experience engagement. So this is not separate. It's part of the report, but it yeah. has its own space. So it's mm -hmm. really important that people kind of do that, uh, go and have a look at that as well. And now we are discussing with, we are discussing with Welcome into making this, this more like a live, uh, no, not live, but interacting. So the report remains a report, isn't it? We want this, transform this into a tool that people yes. can query. So we are discussing with Welcome into making our website a searchable platform yeah. so that people can really query search in an interactive way. At the moment, it's basic, but there's so much that we can develop. So yeah. we are yeah. aiming to kind of do that. No, fingers crossed indeed. I look forward to seeing that the interactive tool in due course. So Louise, we're literally um, a couple of minutes just of your time more, yes. if that's okay. So we've covered a lot of ground and actually we sort of started with reflecting on 25 years in the UK. So we try and end with a sort of one question or a question or two, but let's go one last question, which isn't specifically about your work. But it's a, a sort of reflective mode. Is I mean, what, what advice would you give your 16-year-old self, looking back on what you've learned in between? I think it would be, um, it's okay not to fit in. 
It's okay mm -hmm. not to follow the, um, not to fit the box in some ways. And I think that this is true for me in my personal life. I, I don't think I, I follow the usual path of getting married, having kids and buying a house and stuff like this. Um, but also in my professional life where I never feel I fit. You know, I'm not a sociologist. I'm not a geneticist. I'm not a developmentalist. I'm not, I, I don't have any kind of affiliated associations. So I never fit the bill somehow. And it is okay because I fit a little bit everywhere. So oh, I like that. I like that. I fit a little bit <clears throat> everywhere. Brilliant. It's a brilliant end. So please, thanks on behalf of Craig and I. Thanks so much. It was a really fast conversation. Wait, what about the drink or the coffee? Oh, well, we can do the coffee. Well, okay, we could time. <laughs> last hey! question and one last question then. If you had anybody living yes. or dead that you yes. could have a coffee or a dinner with, who would that be? I think it would be my dear friend, Professor Michael Rutter, who passed away a few years ago. And he used to come in my office and he would sit in the beautiful chairs that I have here. You cannot see them, but um, I have beautiful chairs as well that match the plants. He would come here whenever he was in the office and we would have a chat about anything, not just necessarily about research, but about anything. And I remember... We organized a memorial for him at King's College London. And of course, I was in charge of that. Um, and I remember that after this event, which was very emotional, but a beautiful day, at the end of that day, I got the message from the welcome saying, OK, you're invited for an interview for the landscaping project. Uh. So quite often, I kind of link Michael to that project yes and I feel it really kind of inspired me throughout this process and a lot of the time I'm thinking I wish Michael could come in my office and I can have a chat with him about yeah. you oh. know what we did and what he thinks about that yeah well it's a lovely way to end and what a remarkable individual and the contribution that he made is just remarkable and yes. will be with us for many many years to come so on that note, Louise, again, on behalf of Craig and I, huge thanks for the work that you're doing and continue to do. And thanks for taking the time to speak to us on our podcast. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.